London Live. Thank you very much indeed for being with us today. The Everyday Sexism Project then gathered huge momentum uh, when its concept was introduced online by East London and Laura Bates. It records all sexism experienced by women on a day-to-day -day basis. Melina Pohn uh, went to meet the founder to see how the project is affecting people's lives and what can be done to tackle the issue. I think that if we live in a world where we open the door to the minor infractions and say, come on girls, just put up with it, it's not that big a deal if a man shouts about your boobs in the street, then you're bringing people up, and young people especially, in a society where you say it's okay to see women as second-class citizens, and that opens the door to some of the more serious abuses. A lot of people have come to the site, seen other women writing about things that have happened, and gone, actually, I do have the right to stand up to this. Other people are standing up to this. It's not making a fuss about nothing. You know, you asked what had shocked me. The number of people who write in who are under the age of 16, girls aged 12 and 13, who are being groped and grabbed and touched at school. There was a young woman who wrote to us to say that she had been masturbated on on the tube on her way to work. So many stories from women in the workplace who don't feel able to report what's happening because they're afraid of losing their jobs, particularly in this climate. I was groped on the bus. No one said a word. Word, that speaks volumes about what we're prepared to accept. And I think if enough people on that bus that day, even one or two, had stood up and said, what are you doing, that's not OK, it sends such a clear message about what is and isn't socially acceptable, and we can all play a part in that. So much of what we needed in terms of legislation in this country, particularly in policy, has already been won. But what we're seeing is that it isn't trickling down to have an impact on the ground. So, for example, workplace sexual harassment legislation is fantastic. But the biggest single category of incidents that's reported to us is women in the workplace being harassed, experiencing sexism, experiencing even forms of abuse and assault and being discriminated against. So obviously that's not actually having an impact. And as frustrating as it is, what we need is a cultural shift. It has to be about us each going out there and taking responsibility for the circle that we move in, challenging our friends, challenging our peers and standing up to it when we see it, so that we change this idea that sexism is just normal and socially acceptable and kind of a bit of a laugh. The wonderful thing about living in London, I think, is that at least there's this incredible sense of community. There are people doing these incredibly exciting, vibrant, creative things. And it makes me feel really hopeful that we are finding ways of addressing the problem and that there is so much appetite. We've heard from so many male Londoners who've talked about ways that they've started challenging these issues. We heard from one man who was walking past a building site and there were two women walking past at the same time. And some of the builders shouted, get your boobs out at the women. And he just quickly lifted his T-shirt up instead. Now, I know it's just a small gesture, but actually it sends a message to those guys, you know, why would you say it to them? You wouldn't say it to me. And it sends a message to those women, you're not alone, actually, and, and I will take a stand, I will stand up for you. So there you go, Laura Bates talking to us uh, there. I'm joined now in the studio to discuss the issues surrounding feminism by Ros Hardy, Chief Executive of Object, a feminist organisation, and Mike Buchanan from the Anti-Feminism League. I think the sexism debate is very much, um, very much dominated by women. So we have women like Laura Bates, a whiny, miserable woman. I think it's who, a bit harsh to say. Well, it's, well, it's true. Uh, she is just a whiny woman who encourages other women to be whiny. And the truth is that men suffer from sexism infinitely more than women. And, Ros, I mean, if from your sort of like standpoint, essentially, then, historically, what are the issues that women have had to deal with? And, and coming back off Mike's point there, that, I think, what do you make of that? Well, I th obviously, we would contest the idea that men suffer from sexism more than women. But I think as a feminist organisation, which primarily is concerned about the impact on women of sexism, there's absolutely no sense whatsoever that we don't agree that there are some areas where men suffer disadvantage. For example, one of the key areas you've um, highlighted is men around mental health. Um, particularly, it's really tragic that we're living a city where young men are disproportionately likely to die as a result of suicide. That is really, really tragic. What we would contest is the idea that it is feminists who've caused that problem in terms of young men's mental health. Feminists. Rather, we would suggest that to a significant extent, it's the huge pressure on young men being brought up from a very young age around the boys don't cry culture. So the idea that problems that men face are caused by women rather than caused by broader problems in society is one we contest. And without knowing the background in terms of your own campaign, 
What we're very concerned about is that men's right campaigns are often a thinly veiled cover for the rights of men, for example, abusive men in domestic violence Absolutely relationships nonsense. to continue to have access feminists to their children. Always, feminists That's always, often feminists, the case. Ros, always Ros, you've the had case. Quite, quite a time. Feminists always make things worse for men. So if we take domestic violence, 40% of victims of domestic violence are men. There is virtually no support for them in this country. Um, out of out of well over 4,000 refuge places for for battered people, over you know, 11 of them are, are, are therefore straight men. And the reason for that is that feminists have taken all the funding for domestic violence. Okay, I would disagree with you on the idea that feminists dispute the idea that some men are victims of domestic violence. I would disagree with you on the prevalence of the vast majority of domestic violence is committed by men. Absolutely However, nonsense. However, Absolute however, personally, personally, I'm personally, sorry, let's, that bring is, it, let's bring it back to the that, issue. I'm sorry, so, but that is an outright lie. Right, well, and, and I will call you out on it. The, the vast majority are not. I can hold so, my hand up and say that I've personally been involved in developing commissioning services for male victims of domestic violence. But the unseen, the, the, uns lied. the unseen okay, victims we'll, we'll of domestic violence are the young boys who are child witnesses. And yeah. I think when we're talking about males' rights, the, the men's rights that I really would respect are men like Jermaine Douglas, yeah. the, um, the young man yeah, yeah, who was yeah, a child yeah. witness of domestic violence. Yeah. He is a hero, as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Not only has he spoken about, about, about the terrible pain and suffering that he witnessed from his mother, the impact on him personally, he's gone out and worked with English football clubs yeah. to publicly encourage men to understand that there are certain types of behaviour that are just not acceptable. Sure. As feminists, we are very, very concerned about the impact of feminism on society. But the idea, I understand, for example, one of your heroes is Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher would not have been able to have been elected but for feminist campaigning for women's suffrage. Absolute nonsense. So I suggest you go to herbertpurdy.com and find the truth about how women got the vote. And feminists lie as they always lie in oh, countless areas. So, uh, Mike, I just want to ask you first, uh, men, do they get a rough deal from this sexism debate? I think they do. We hear constantly from women like Laura Bates and Caroline Criado Perez. Um, about objectification of women, but um, um, women objectify men just as much. They objectify men in terms of appearance, and they objectify men also in terms of their income. So, for example, you know, it's, it's, it's hardly rocket science to say that beautiful women don't tend to have the ambition of marrying long-distance lorry drivers, do they? Um, now, do lorry drivers whine about that? Of course they don't. It's the way the world works. And it's time for women to stop whining about men uh, objectifying women, which, which at the end of the day is just men finding attractive women attractive. And is what would you say to that then, Ros? Because is that the difference. case? There's a different, complete difference between people finding other people attractive, people find each other attractive for all sorts of reasons, and a culture in which the media regularly portrays women as the most single most important thing about us is what we look like. Where we have page three of the Sun, for example, where we have the um, the Daily Sport and the Sunday Sport on display at ankle height in terms of children, page after page after page of naked or semi-clad women being exposed as if the most important thing about us is our bodies and, and about our breasts. That why yeah. that's no one is saying that's, that's the most important why thing. Why that is a problem in a, in a world where there wasn't high levels of violence against women, where there wasn't significant problems of sexual harassment, it would just be words. However, these are often pictures which encourage and create to a climate where it is created that that's what we are and that's what we're for. And that's why organisations like Object want to talk about the impact of media sexism and the impact of those images, in particularly in terms of encouraging producers and the media, etc., to think this isn't actually okay. really good about our brand. Let, let, I think, for example, if you look at The Sun, actually, if you look at men reading The Sun, a significant number start at the back. They only ever read the sports pages. Let's bring I'm not even convinced that, so that many Sun readers actually follow the page that has a three. effect on society? No, it's complete nonsense. Let, let, let's talk about media sexism, shall we? Um, Laura Bates and Caroline Criado Perez, the woman behind the Women on Banknotes, mm. um, they individually have more mainstream exposure globally than every men's human rights advocate has combined Are over the last 40 years. No, no, the, no, there's a, there's a lot just, going on. And if, 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 if anybody wants to, if anybody wants to, if anybody wants to, uh, Ross, would you right? please stop in, interrupting? If, if anybody wants to understand about men's human rights abuses, they should go to avoiceformen.com and they will learn a great deal. I was at a conference in, in Detroit giving a presentation five or six weeks ago, a um, very successful conference, um, and, and you know, um, feminists are, are, you know, are going to have 
problems in future because because we are exposing your lies for what they are. I would say one of the worst examples of objectification of men was what the Sun newspaper did to Liverpool football supporters after 96 people were killed after the Hillsborough disaster. Significantly, the images that were portrayed by the Sun, mainly of male Liverpool supporters, was a massive attack on men and massive attack particularly on working class men of Liverpool. It was not feminists who did that, it was the Sun newspaper. And you, that, it and is Regularly, feminists are accused of things that we've never done, that we've never said, that we never will say, we never have done. Who on earth forces women to go onto page three of the Sun? It's just ridiculous. Economic and social pressure. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. There are thousands of women very happy to earn very easy money for doing very little. And regardless of how the choices that women make, I think we have to... This have is women as victims. All so the time, women as victims. I've got to wrap this up now, but in one word, uh, does sexism still exist today, in your opinion? Yes, of course it does, and it also towards harms... Women. And, uh, towards women, but it also harms men. And, men, and yeah. part of the conversation that it's really important to have is about how it will be of massive benefit to men, as well as women, to get beyond the M narrow gender stereotypes much that more than groups one word like that was. sexism Brilliant stuff, but, uh, pushes us into. And, Mike, um, from your point of view, then, uh, obviously... Men, 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 men suffer vastly more from sexism than women. I mean, some of this whiny stuff from Laura Bates. You know, men, I mean, fathers denied See, access to their children. They're, we have 17 areas in our election manifesto where where sexism basically makes life very, very difficult, yeah. very difficult for men. And I've, I've yet to find, find a feminist who can, who can tell me one area of, 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 uh, you know, of, of you know, anything like as serious. Sure, brilliant. Mike, thank, again, more than one word, but thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed, Ros, as well. And more on that, of course, in Headline London. But today's poll today. Well, joining me now is Stephanie Davis Arai from No More Page Three, Ai Kamara Lassarai from the Imkam Feminist Organisation, and Michael Buchanan from the Alternative Sexism Project. Now, I'm going to ask, I'm going to start with uh, you, Ai Kamara. Do you see that there is still a need for, for, for forums like Everyday Sexism? Absolutely. I think <clears throat> sexism has been so normalised that when you do talk about incidents, it's kind of like, ah. Oh, be serious, it's not a big deal. So I think a project like that allows people to go, actually, you know, this has been happening and it's not OK, that's been happening and it's not OK, and kind of see how many people it's happening to, like, oh, it's not just me, loads of people are affected by this issue. What do you think when you see forums like that? I think it's amazing what Laura Bates has done. I think everyday sexism, in a, in a sense, grew organically from one woman deciding to sort of put something on a, on a website and then there was a flood and just from the amount of um, entries onto the Everyday Sexism Project website you can see what a huge problem it is and women, young girls, all ages um, talking about um, the sexism they've experienced throughout their lifetime and often haven't told anybody about before. So yeah, it's fantastic, yeah, put it out there and, and let's discuss it. It's been hidden away, I think. Now, Everyday Sexism, Mike, as a term, what do you think of that? I think there's plenty of everyday sexism, but the serious sexism is against men and boys. Um, Laura Bates is a whiny, miserable woman who runs a project that encourages other women to become whiny and miserable and dysfunctional. She, and so basically, it, it, basically, she's tapping into women's um, inclination to become special snowflakes, where there's no challenges. Everything, you know, the, she talks about the culture has to change. She, you, you can no more change a culture than you can change the weather. It is pathetic. It is infantilizing women beyond belief. And it's men who are suffering the real sexism today. I'm sure someone would want to it's, rebuttal it's, that. Well, it's interesting that when women actually stand, stand up and call out sexism, they're always accused of moaning and whining, which is, we've just had a great example of everyday sexism, um, stereotyping women as whingers and moaners. And you've said it all, really. Well, so, you know, uh, I've been on her website, obviously. You know, we, 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 we call it the Everyday Whining Project. And there are, there are women complaining about things like... Well, in fact, in, in her interview, complaining about, what, someone on a construction site saying, get your boobs out. I mean, what, what do we have to do? Go behind every woman with a fainting couch so that, they, you know, you only get strong in this life by meeting challenges. And if women are going to sort of pass out with shock at, at things like that, they're going to remain children. Could I, I ask... Think that Go on. You should have to tolerate sexual harassment. And I think the, the fact that the project has been discussed in, in that way, I think it's one thing to disagree, but I think when you start personally attacking someone who's created this project, which has had engagement from, like, tens of thousands of women, I think, 
what can I say? There's lots of lots of whiny women out there, and she's and she's creating more of them. Do, Mike, if you had uh, have female relatives, friends who came to you with a story of being touched inappropriately or spoken to inappropriately out and about. Would your response be the same to them? I'd expect them as strong women to deal with it at the, with it at the time. You know, at the end of the how, day... How, how would you see them deal with it? Well, I, I would think, you know, if, if, you know, if a woman's groped on, on a bus, for example, I think, you know, it's, you know, I hardly like to sort of suggest physical violence, but, you know, a, sl a slap or something of the man concerned, you know, would be appropriate. Um, we, we, I looked last night at some of the reviews of Laura Bates's book on Amazon, and there are a number of one star, that's the lowest rating you can give, and I, I'm, I'm, I'll just, I'll be 10 seconds on this. And, um, Mike, well, I don't see the merit in, in criticising, <laughs> personally attacking. We're discussing the issue wider, no, but we're I'm discussing saying, wider, the, the wider issue I'm, of everyday sexism I'm rather saying, than Laura Bates in person. Alex, I'm saying what women, this is, this is a female reviewer, saying, saying um, everyday blathering on about mainly everyday occurrences that most people don't even register. But I, that, I think that points to what we were discussing earlier about things being normalised. And I, and I think if you want to see strong women, this is the first step. The first step of being a strong woman is calling it out publicly and saying this is not OK. There's a tiny proportion so of men who that's will... Me that's it, what women are starting to do. But and the Everyday tiny... Sexism Project has really given women a voice and a platform which women have not had before. Women have had a platform for, for, for decades in, in all sorts of areas. But it, it's, it's just... Um... You know, it is, it, it is just ridiculous to think that... I mean, it's, it's a tiny number of men who are doing this stuff. And to paint the whole of, of, of mankind, you know, all men, with that brush, I think it's outrageous. I, I'm not sure who's painting yeah. all men with the brush. Well, who, 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 who are you thinking well, about? Well, I mean, you know, this culture change. I mean, how is this culture change going to happen precisely? You know, Laura Bates can no more change the culture, uh, along with her followers, than she can change the weather. It is just pathetic. Let's go back to, to everyday sexism, and, and, and as I'll speak to, to Stephanie and Aikamara about this, because it's, you'll have a different opinion, but what do you think the effects of everyday sexism, from something of being you know, catcalled as you walk down the street to something more serious, of which there are plenty of examples on that website, what do you think the impact is on that? Um, I mean, it's everything from self-esteem and kind of what opportunities are available to you, whether you begin to kind of shrink yourself to f fit into society's expectations or you're specifically told, no, you can't do this because of X. Um, and then there's things like domestic violence. One in three women will have experienced domestic violence in their lifetime. Two women die a week. They of, not. Uh, Mike, would we okay. will... That's just factually wrong. Mike, we'll get your, your point of view in a second, sorry. I can't. Um, so it's, it's quite a big scale. And, and to you, Stephanie, do you think it has, it, I think it has an enormous impact? And the problem with those sort of casual, everyday sexism um, examples is that the impact is largely invisible. Um, you don't, you know, those, those supposedly small examples, they add up, and over a lifetime, you're constantly reminded as a woman that you're there just as sexual entertainment, just as um, something for, for men to enjoy. And you're constantly reduced to that level. And every woman has her stories from childhood onwards of that kind of treatment. And the impact, I think, is huge, and I think it's bigger than we actually than we actually recognise, because I don't think human beings can live with that kind of... seeing themselves mirrored back in that way without it having quite a, a deep effect. Now, sexism, of course, affects both men and women, and I know that's something that you're interested in, but have you yourself ever experienced sexism? Indeed, yes. About uh, five or six years ago, I went for <coughs> a management consulting position, a business consulting position in the public sector, and was turned down by a pretty vile feminist. Um, who had never been known to take on a male consultant. In fact, she was, she was, uh, well, she had just never, but, but she had to interview males so, so, so that she could say that she saw as many males as females. But she, she, she would, the, the agency I went to admitted in the end that she would far sooner take on an incompetent woman than a competent man. But I think people would be outraged by that as equally as they would be outraged by a man doing the same to women. Don't, would you agree? I mean, sexism isn't just 
a feminist issue. Yes, and when you get down to personal individual examples, of course there are going to be examples of the opposite happening. Of course there are. Okay. But o overall, the, the sort of sex, there's a very laddish sexist culture which, uh, which holds women back on a far greater scale it hold, than it, it holds hold men women back. back. You have to be joking. There's nothing holding women back. There's a great deal. I mean, you know, I, I lead the political party Justice for Men and Boys. And in there, we, we'll have 17 areas in our manifesto where the state assaults the human rights and interests of men and boys. And not one feminist in five years has ever been able to tell me one area where the state disadvantages women and girls. Not one. And I'd like to pick up on the issue. Th this is all about victimhood and getting power through victimhood. So, so, so the issue of two men dying, t sorry, two, two uh, women a week, is it? Yeah. Th that's, a, that's like, there's no other word for it. That's, that's just a lie. That's true. It's not. Uh, eight, it was 88. It was once, t it was once t two a week. Over the last 10 years, the number of women killed by partners has declined by 25%. But that's just one of countless I lying feminist narratives I that we expose all the time. Okay. I suggest you go and look at counting dead women and the number of women who've been killed so far this year, and it supports that statistic. I'm going to bring in some comments from our viewers now, because obviously this is a subject that's got a lot of people talking on our Facebook page. Let's have a look at some of the things you've been saying. So Francine says, some women believe in sexism and get offended at the slightest little thing, whereas man men just don't seem bothered. I'm all for a bit of feminism standing up for equal rights, but it seems to be going too far these days, and it's like trying to take over the world. Um, so is it, a, is it a case of women being too sensitive sometimes? Would you ever see an argument for that? No. <laughs> Basically. Um, I, th I think sometimes people get a little bit uncomfortable when people are trying to achieve equality because it means making space for people that have thus far been marginalised. But I think when we start to go down the road of people are being too sensitive, I think it again comes back to what we're accepting as normal. Like, this is OK, you should just be able to tolerate that. OK, let's get another tweet now and we'll give you a chance to chat in a second. Uh, so Michelle says, everyday sexism, very prevalent in society, not helped by the media uh, and its portrayal of women. Now, I'm going to bring you two in here because this is actually something that you both are very outspoken about. It's about the portrayal of yes. women and men in media. So they're saying that it's not helped by media. I think the, the media really creates a culture where women are seen as sex objects. And obviously, I work for the No More Page 3 campaign, which is the most famous example of that, where daily there is gratuitous, a gratuitous image of a, a nearly naked woman who, whose sole purpose is to titillate men. Uh, that doesn't happen to men anywhere throughout the the print media and that is a very public newspaper and newspapers are if a newspaper is used as a newspaper that will be opened up in front of women in front of children it's in cafes it's in pubs it's on public transport so we can't get away from it and it's it's every time we see it as women it's a reminder of our our worth to society and our society allows a national newspaper to print um, soft porn images of women that used to be on the top shelf um, and so so girls growing up in this culture get the message yes our whole society supports that and allows it and so we get you know we get the message from our society about our position in it we have literally 30 seconds okay. left, Mike. OK. Um, page 3 is just, just one example of, of, of a phenomenon. That there are vast numbers of women who are very happy um, to, to exploit their attractiveness, whether it's um, in getting a well-off partner or, or, or going on page 3 or whatever else. Women exploit their att attractiveness. Women, women objectify themselves. So the, the, the idea that somehow it's some sort of conspiracy to keep women down is absolute nonsense. And the presence of page three as an advertisement for being that, you know, be, exposing yourself publicly every single day is like an advertisement to young girls that that's what's expected of them. And an advertiser would pay billions for that space to advertise something. I'm, I know that this could carry on for quite a while longer. I'm going to leave the last say to, to our viewers who have been getting in touch. Just a couple more tweets now. 
And Matthew says, at last, all us male uh, psychopaths vindicated. Sociopaths, sorry, sociopaths, can't read that far away. And Matthew writes, Simon says, at last, all are, oh, again, okay, sorry. Rebel Girl says, sexism is usual, but the word normal implies it's everydayness. It's okay, it's not okay. Um, and last one here from Amai says, feminists strive for equality and fairness regardless of gender. How does that make life difficult for men? Um, obviously, this discussion is going to rumble on. Don't forget, you can have your say on our Facebook page and our Twitter page, but also we've been running a poll today asking you if you think sexism has become a norm in everyday society. Let's have a look at the results. 91% say yes, sexism has become a normal part of society. Do keep up the discussion on our website and our Facebook page. Thank you very much to all of our guests for coming in today. It's, it's a very interesting topic. London Live.